TSX Least Exploration Company operating in Mongolia, ASX Code XM. This year, Zala just signed a strategic partnership with one of the largest Chinese mining companies focuses on copper and gold, Zijing Mining. So today, we are very pleased to invite the executive chairman of Zaladu, Connie Mohead, to join us. Welcome, Connie. Hi, Hannah. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Connie, could you please briefly introduce Zaladu and its project to our readers? What's the main focus of Zaladu Mines? Sure. Zanadu Mines, as you said, is an ASX and TSX listed company that is solely focused on exploring for or free copper gold deposits in, in the South Kobe part of Mongolia. Hmm. Uh, we started many years ago as a coal focused company, but uh, over the years have evolved into a company that's just purely focused on copper exploration in Mongolia. Thank you. As far as I know, you started your career as a BHP graduate and later went on to an illustrious career at copper and gold miner, New Chris Mining. And more recently, Need Murderka Copper Gold as a CEO, successfully developing a project in Indonesia. The stock went up 713% in the last five years. That's amazing. Can you talk through your background and how this has shaped your leadership approach at Zalad Mines? Sure. As you said, I'm a geologist by training, and, and my early years were shaped working for you know, a very good company in BHP and, uh, and Newcrest. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on the ground in working in both mines and in exploration, uh, mostly in copper and gold. Um, as I uh, became more senior, I held leadership positions at uh, Newcrest Telfer Gold Mine as chief shoulders, and then was on the startup management team for the Cadia Valley operations, which included Cadia Ridgeway and the current giant Cadia East deposit. And after that, I uh, stint at uh, the very rich uh, Goswan Gold Mine in Indonesia. Uh, so I've been in copper and gold all my life with a strong technical background. Uh, in 2008, I became the executive chair, executive uh, general manager of minerals for Newcrest, which is basically responsible for all things geology at, at Newcrest. Newcrest had grown to become a large company. Uh, based uh, which had grown on innovation and exploration, and uh, I was part of that team. Eight years at Newcrest were leading global exploration and development. Uh, so there's, there's hardly a copper or gold deposit in the world that I haven't seen or looked at in some way, shape, or form. Um, I was always interested in the uh, Tuju Bukit deposit in Indonesia. Uh, it had non technical issues when I was at uh, Tuju Bukit, uh, when I was at Newcrest, but they were largely. Um, resolved by the time I left Newcrest in 2015. And in 2016, I joined Medeca as their uh, inaugural CEO. Uh, and that job was basically building the, uh, the oxide gold mine uh, that, that sits above the Tuju Book of Porphyry Copper Deposit. That was a, a very successful uh, commission construction and that mine has been, become the, you know, the base cash flow that's made Medeca very successful. Uh, and at that time, we also started the, the scoping study and PFS into Tuju Bukit. So I come from a, 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 a sort of a, a broad technical background with deep understanding of porphyry copper deposits. And uh, I have um, good experience in, in Australia and in Asia in, in, uh, in developing and, and operating mines. So it, that shaped my views of uh, of Xanadu. Xanadu uh, is very similar in many ways to Cadia. It's a, it's a porphyry copper belt that has uh, potential for very large porphyry systems. And uh, uh, I was able to visit uh, Hamagtai in, in the South Kobe just prior to COVID setting in. And what struck me was there were some very, uh, some relatively high grade components to the system. And mm -hmm. I felt if we, could, if we could resolve those high grade components, we could we could turn this uh, operation uh, into something that would uh, eventually be constructed. Thank you. So Zaladu operates two copper gold projects in Mongolia, flagship project Kamakta project and uh, Red Mountain project. When you joined Zaladu, what was it that attracted you to this copper and gold projects in Mongolia? 
Yeah, as I said before, it's uh, the South Gobi contains some volcanic belts that are highly prospective for for porphyry and porphyry related copper and gold deposits. At Half Magti, I, I saw a system that that has a lot of similarities to Cadia and a lot of similarities to the giant uh, IU Tolgoi uh, project, uh, which is uh, a Rio project. And I felt that uh, you know that uh, growth potential as well as the potential for high grade components to the system uh, was very exciting. Uh, you know, the world needs copper and I, and I feel that it's projects like Amagtai and possibly Red Mountain that will provide that copper in, in, into the ne in near future. Great. So since you have been involved in with Zalabu, what in-country challenges have you faced? Oh, it, it's it's an interesting country, uh, of course, being landlocked between Russia and China. Uh, probably the biggest challenge is not so much the normal challenges. The normal challenges are uh, people issues associated with ESG and infrastructure. Uh, and most copper projects around the world have those challenges. Not so much in Mongolia. I think Mongolia's problem as a relatively new democracy is that they're still sorting out their mining law. So uh, uh, there was uh, perceptions that Mongolia was an unstable uh, political jurisdiction due to the, uh, highlighted by the fact that there was an ongoing dispute between Rio Tinto and the Yayi Tolgo project and the government of Mongolia. That has uh, largely resolved itself now, which I think is a credit to both Rio and the government of Mongolia. And when you look past that, uh, I think Mongolia is really looking to improve their, their uh, perceptions around foreign in investment into Mongolia. Uh, and uh, I believe are working towards a, a more transparent and competitive mining code. So it's really in terms of financing, you need stability and, and clarity. And, uh, you know, there's been perceptions that that's been lacking in the past, but I feel Mongolia is very quickly moving in the right direction and uh, will be uh, a major copper jurisdiction moving forward. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I think most of our readers are very interested in Zalabic projects and the strategic partnership with Zijing Mining. So this April, Zalab announced that a strategic partnership has been built up between Zijing Mining and Zalabu. And Sujin will invest in Zaladu and its Hamagatai project through three stages, eventually create a joint venture to develop the Hamagatai project. Can you please give more details about the partnership and how does this partnership benefit Zaladu's project development? Well, of course, yes. The, one of the largest challenges for a small company like Xanadu when it uh, gets hold of a big project like Hamagatai it's like having the tiger by the tail, you know. So uh, how do you finance uh, and uh, and construct a large project? Um, so, you know, Xanadu brings serious technical and exploration expertise. Xanadu, uh, Zijin brings a strong balance sheet uh, and clear and demonstrated capability to construct and operate large-scale copper operations. So it's a perfect marriage of, of uh, yeah, need and know-how, uh, and I think together uh, we can we can move this project forward. Whereas uh, it's very difficult for a junior company to raise the finance required to build such a large project. Right. The deal itself uh, involves Zijin um, investing at in the Zanadu at the Lisco level, level uh, up to 19.9%. Uh, at an agreed share price, uh, which gives them, you know, a, a significant stake in the company. They will be the company's largest shareholder. At the project level, um, the the uh, Zijin will be investing 35 million US in at the project level, which is more than enough to fund the project through its next phase, which is the pre-feasibility phase. Uh, that will involve approximately. Seven to ten million dollars worth of drilling, uh, mm -hmm. and that much again in, in studies you know, around metallurgy, geotech, and all those things. And we'll also see us go forward with the uh, with the permitting and approvals process. So we we have enough money now to fund ourselves up to that decision for mine, 
which is one of the major hurdles for a junior company with a large project. So not only is some act a good project, it's also uh, well funded to that decision to mine and I believe will be, uh, due to its low ESG risks, mm. will be one, one of the next major copper mines to be constructed in the world. Congratulations on the partnership. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, the support of Zijin. Um, scoping story for Hamaktai Copper Gold project was released in April. Could you please briefly summarize scoping story project metrics? And could you please talk through scoping story from a financial point of view? Sure. So uh, by definition, a scoping study is what you could do with a project and a pre-feasibility pre study is what you should do. And then a feasibility study is what you will do. So a scoping study is, okay, we've got you know, a billion tonnes uh, at that contains three million uh, tonnes of copper and uh, eight million ounces of gold. So a large deposit with potential to grow even further. But for the sake of this exercise, we ruled our line under, under it at 1.1 billion tonnes I said, what can we do with this? And the outcome of that study was a very large uh, vanilla mm. uh, open pit operation uh, based on normal truck and shovel operations. So standard technology extracting uh, approximately seven to 800 million tonnes of that resource over a 30 year period. Initially feeding a 15 million tonne per annum um, uh, copper flotation circuit Mm -hmm. uh, ramping to a 30 million tonne per annum circuit um, after the initial pay payback period. That uh, gives us a mine that produces 35 to 50,000 tonnes of copper per annum uh, and, and over 100,000 ounces of gold per annum over a 30 year mine life. Um, and that's before we add any, uh, add any technical risk in terms of uh, new technologies to, uh, to bring the cost down or the production up which I can talk about a little bit uh, in a minute. So the outcome of that was uh, uh, an operation that um, had, had a, had a uh, uh, upfront capital of rock approximately $600 million, which is large for a small company like us, which is why we needed to do in there. Uh, if it had an MPV based on a $4 copper price of about $600 million, so a, a quite a good capital efficiency ratio. Uh, importantly, due to the gold byproduct credits uh, of quite a low uh, overall uh, sustaining cost of, of producing copper, initially in the first five year period, first quarter, uh, and then over the life of mine around the median uh, uh, cost per, per pound of copper produced. So it's a low cost, long life mine once it's built that is based on very low technical and very low uh, uh, ESG risk. And what that means is due to the strong support of infrastructure in the area, we have power, we have water, we have road, we have rail, we have, uh, you know, the Mongolian government's been investing a lot in infrastructure in that part of the world, particularly in terms of rail links down to China. So uh, we, we'll be producing a copper concentrate that's very clean, has very little uh, arsenic and, and uh, fluorine and other impurities and very strong copper credits. So a very nice, concentrate which can be uh, exported south to smelters in China uh, with, with at a very low transport cost. So in, in many ways it's a very strong project. It does have the upsides of uh, at the moment the oxide material that sits above the, uh, the sulphide is considered waste in our model. There's a very low strip ratio, less than one to one, so less than one tonne of waste for every one tonne of ore. And at the moment that oxide material is waste. We believe based on leach testing results that we can recover uh, copper and gold from that material uh, that will uh, turn that waste liability into, a, into an opportunity. So there's, there's potential to add serious value by processing the oxide. Uh, we are also able to look at uh, in-pit crush and convey technologies to get the haulage cost down and also coarse particle flotation and all sorting to uh, improve the grade to the mill. So all of those opportunities are yet to uh, be built into that scenario. So it's already an attractive project. We believe we can make it more attractive. And of course, there's exploration upside. Uh, uh, we still believe that there's potential at depth for, uh, for higher grade mineralisation, which could be a future underground mine. So 
we, we see it as a, you know, a, a very exciting uh, project at this point in time. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that the Hamakta project has not support from the surrounding environment. And uh, there are media comments that the overall grant of the mine resource in the Hamakta project is not very high, and the development environment and conditions are challenging. Can you please share your thoughts on those comments? Sure. Uh, in terms of grade, you know, people look at grade, but grade isn't the only driver of margin. And what you really need in a mining operation is margin per tonne. So this project works on scale and on byproduct credits. So uh, on a pure copper basis, we're, 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 we're reasonably low grade, but we compare very well to the to the grades being treated at some of the big mines, such as Kayeris and AU Tolgoi at the moment. Um, but what drives this thing is the amount of gold that comes with the copper. So uh, if you have the scale, the, the you know the, the economies of scale, and the byproduct credits, you can actually generate a very good uh, margin per tonne. So it's a bit of a, a, a falsehood looking at just grade. Uh, I was involved in the Cadia project, uh, which started up in the late 90s, and everybody said that was too low to grade to work, and it worked on the same basis, scale and byproduct credits, and was one of the most successful mines. Of the, of, the, of the early 2000s. Uh, the other thing that made KDA great was the NOT great was subsequent discoveries of high grade material. In the case of KDA in Ridgeway, in the case of OT, if you go south. So, you know, there's uh, there's real potential here. So I think looking at just grade is, 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 not a, is not a sensible way to evaluate projects. You need to look at margin per tonne and return on, on, on investment. Um, the uh, the beauty of um, of Hamagta, you say it's a challenging environment, but you know I'm I'm a bloke that spent his career building uh, mines in the mountains of Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Uh, give me a, a flat, sparsely populated, seismically stable uh, part of the world anywhere, and, and I'd rather build a, a mine there. So from an ESG risk point of view, you know, when we the biggest problem facing new mine developments is how do you manage your waste and your tailings. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in a mountainous terrain with with uh, active seismicity. Well, we don't have any of those problems. We'll be building a, a common vanilla tailing storage facility, common hmm. vanilla waste dumps, and I think that is very attractive in a world that uh, is increasingly focused on on those sorts of risks, as, as they should be. Yeah, 